think that's been me stalling for long enough. We can get into some actual matches. So before we go into the match against Ju Chems, we're going to take a look at the deck. Um, I wasn't the only one running a companion deck. I obviously have Luris there, which is just kind of the long value play. Um, but it, it, Luris and Ad Nauseam are good friends. Uh, Jukems is running Zerda, and this is uh, a more a, a more kind of long term deck than the than the Levine Zerda deck that we saw kind of that I, that was the first one I had exposure to in this format where it was truly a turn one or two deck every single time. This one's a much more fair Zerda deck. It still obviously has the broken things you can do with um, Zerda and let's see what is the artifact abilities cost two less so i think staff of domination is going to be the primary win condition here with this let me double check that i'm right about that so you can use one to untap it and then nope this is just a mana sink obviously it's pretty good once you have zero on the field but that's not gonna be the win con hey jukems how you doing uh the grim monolith grim monolith has to be the win condition for this yeah so you use zerda and play grim monolith makes infinite mana once you have infinite mana you can do all sorts of broken things um but the, the cleanest one seems like it's Staff of Domination. The scary thing with this deck is obviously Time Vault goes off. Um, time Vault goes off with Voltaic Key, and I think Staff also is a win con for Time Vault. Nope, just keys, just our creatures. So it'll obviously draw you to the cards eventually, but you don't have the mana. It, you, you need the infinite mana to be able to do that. Transmute Artifact is a great way to find the Time Vault, or the key for that matter, um, and can find you the... Uh, Grim Monolith if you need to. So there's lots of like fun, good synergies in this deck. I actually really like this one. I think it has kind of a, a different look to a lot of Zerda decks that we've seen. And it uh, it also just has like super grindy value engines in these in all these Karns. So uh, Karn the Great Creator is obviously pretty punishing against my deck, given that I have a few artifacts in it. Um, but it's also can be a win con in and of itself, being able to go with Megas and Lattice or in a slower game to get the liquid metal, metal coating and breaking out all the all the graveyards shenanigans. Um, yeah, there, there's tons of interesting synergies here. Basalt Monolith can play the Grim Monolith as well, of course. Um, but for when, when I'm looking at this matchup, the things I'm, I'm trying to go fast, right? I'm trying to go real fast, and I want to be able to watch for interaction so that I know if I can storm off or not. The cards that I'm scared of in game one uh, I don't think there's anything that jumps out immediately. Things I have to be aware of are, uh, let's see, there's not any hard blocks that would just stop a Thassa's Oracle win or a Storm win, other than Karn into um, the Lattice. Obviously stops me from being able to make mana. Uh, and let's re-read re the Lattice to make sure I understand it. It says that all cards are colorless and they're all artifacts and that means that Karn makes their activated abilities no longer work so uh yeah basically no nothing can tap for um they i can't i cannot activate any artifact abilities to make mana which i think precludes anything that could make mana at all for me um so if, if we get to that turn then things are going to go very bad but i think i should be able to like, hopefully get underneath it uh Pithy Needle can, can stop the Black Lotus, I believe. Pithy Needle is the good one. Yes. No, Pithy Needle cannot stop Black Lotus. That, that's the, the Revoker's one that stops Black Lotus. So Pithy Needle doesn't have massive impacts against me, unless I'm wrong. So yeah, I think Game Water is just about going fast. That's, that's the way I'm reading this matchup. So let's actually cut over to the, the tape and see how, see how it went. So starting off normal, and let's jump forward to the actual start of the game. Uh, Alright, Conjurer is Bauble. This deck is wild. This is going to be a whole lot of me remembering how this game works, but start off with Alluris as a companion, and Jukams, of course, has Alluris as well, or has a uh, companion as well in Zerda. So, this is, I think, game one. Um, I feel pretty good about this, because I think that I'm generally faster than most decks with all my tutors. Uh, Jukams obviously has tutors as well, but not being able to like execute them on turn one, not having Black Lotus, means that my deck, uh, I think... Hopefully, should be able to be faster. Um, and this hand looks pretty strong. It doesn't do anything immediately, but having Mystic Remora against a deck that is going to be uh, trying to go a little faster um, is is nice. Although I, I have I'm going second, so I think I, I think I still keep this hand. This seems pretty strong. Mystic Remora allows for um, 
like there's not going to be a turn one dumping out three artifacts that are going to make Mr. Kamora seem really dumb. Uh, Jukems opens with the tap land. The artifact land obviously is very strong um, in that deck. So turn one, Dark Ritual, Black Lotus. And this is a lot of things happening. Um, there's a lot of choices that could be happening here, right? It's initially five, six mana just sitting there. Um, but six mana, this isn't a matchup where I want to just expose Luris right away. Uh, I'd much rather cast Mr. Grimora, grind a couple of cards of value, and then get my value that way instead of having to, um, instead of uh, waiting. Jukem's on turn two gets a time vault into play. It's obviously really strong. Uh, I draw the card off of it, get my one for one off of Mr. Grimora, and then just throw it in the trash, and we're going to be going right now, hopefully. Uh, I need to. I would need to do some math here, but having the Conjurer's Bauble plus the Imperial Seal means that I can generate a Demonic Tutor on the fly. Uh, so I don't see it right now. Let's see. Black Lotus, Dark Ritual, uh, Imperial Seal for Vampiric, uh, and Conjurer's Bauble. That's five spells. Casting Dark Ritual, Black Lotus is seven. Imperial Seal is eight. Conjurer's Bauble is nine. And then draw into the uh, draw into the death wish, going to get tendrils. I haven't checked the mana on that. If the mana works though, that would be a pretty good line. So let's see if that's the line we go for, or if a uh, past me was smarter and found a better one, given that the mana may or may not be there. But this this is a lot of mana, right? One, two, three, four, seven, uh, down to five after the conjurer's bauble and imperial seal then down to two after the yog moths back up to five back up to seven into uh, back down to five and death wish would put me to two so i could brain freeze i could do a giant brain freeze um but mana wise i can't get can't get the tendrils on this one so let's see if that's if that's the line we're definitely going for something so i, I think it has to be this brain freeze line i don't see a um, a way to make Doomsday. There's no drawing off the Doomsday that I can find because you need to use a draw from the Conjurer's Bubble to get the Imperial Seal, um, Imperial Seal target. So, I, yeah, I, I don't, I don't see a good Doomsday pile here. Um, with only one draw, you're pretty crimped on that. There might no, there's probably not a Takanuma pile either because you can use Takanuma. Um, this is a card that basically never gets any love, and for good reason. I think it's really slow, but you can pay four mana and discard it from your hand to mill four and then put a creature into your hand. Or, yeah, a creature in your hand, I think. I think it's a raised dead. So you can use it to basically, for paying six mana, to mill four cards off Doomsday and then put a, oh, okay, I go for Ad Nauseam. I, I wonder if maybe the storm didn't work out for the brain freeze, given that there's 34 cards. I would need to have, uh, what, 12 storm? That seems like it should have worked. I don't know. I, I, there's an Ad Nauseam happening, so that's obviously the line I went for. I would need to run back the tape and see for sure, but I think a Brain Freeze pile could have gotten to at least 12 Storm. But I'm at 16 life with an Ad Nauseam. It's like super unlikely things go badly. Um, so down to 11. Let's see, we have zero mana floating. That's pretty bad, actually. No mana, and... Oh, I didn't I didn't actually go for the Yawgmoth's, uh, pile, the Yawgmoth's run. So a six mana left, no land drop ready to go. Uh, I think I lose here. I don't... I, it's very possible I, I miscounted my math there. And that I... Because past me was for sure better pilot of this deck than current me. Um, but my assumption would be that... that I, I must have done something wrong with the math and that brain freeze line. Uh, and I, I feel like I just have to go for it here, given that, uh, given that there's a time vault and we're threatening. And I believe after the match, I confirmed with your chems, uh, and you can confirm you're here in chat, obviously, but that, that you actually did have the, the key in hand. So I would have been dead if I had waited another turn. So uh, I, I wouldn't feel comfortable. I think it's the correct choice to try to go for it there. But Ad Adnaz with like zero mana sources in the deck is pretty bad. Yeah, okay, so he had it. So regardless, I was dead. I still, I, I, wanna, I wanna, after this is over, go back and check to see if I am wrong about my brain freeze count there. Um, but I think there might have been a, a, a death wish into brain freeze option there earlier. Uh, Siding plans here. Ceremonies rejections, obviously great against the artifact deck. Douthy Voidwalker um, is kind of just a value card a lot of the time. I'm not sure if that's correct or not, uh, but 
knocking out graveyard stuff seems like it's good sometimes. I don't know. Collective Brutality coming in. That's obviously not a duress, so it can only hit instants and sorceries. I'm going to pause here and go back and look at Jukem's list to see why I'm bringing in all these cards. Because, like, with a card board, oftentimes you'll be really constrained and not be actually... Like, they don't have a lot of things that you'd want to get Collective Brutality to go get. Um, they're not going to be bringing in counter spells and things like that because their their sideboard is so full of, uh, of current targets. So, I don't love this Collective Brutality, just looking at it right now. I do really like a Ceremonious Rejection. Um, I think cutting Imperial Seals often correct. Uh, Swan Song cannot hit artifacts. It's only creatures, enchantments, and something else. Uh, a, a creature, or instant sorcerers and enchantments, I believe. Um, no need for Hope of Yerper. And yeah, okay, so I don't, I don't see any reason for this Collective Brutality. It could be that this is still back in the, when I thought the Collective Brutality could hit uh, could hit any duress target, so maybe that's the reason I'm bringing it in. Energy flux is the is what this match is really about, though. If I can resolve an energy flux against Jukems, uh, it's the game's over. Yeah, as you say in chat, it's just like such a busted card. Like there are times where I think you can go um, where he could get so far ahead of me that energy flux isn't good enough. But if I can resolve an energy flux on turn three, it's just a near lock for these artifact decks. We saw the same thing against um, against the uh, Goblin Welder deck. Uh, so maybe that's it. Is I'm just like Collector Brutality is a way to, to, to help get to uh, to help get to maybe be able to survive long enough to get to a Energy Flux, and that's what the match is about. Um, that seems reasonable to me. I still don't love it though. Uh, oh, okay, yeah. So this is the match where I realized that Collector Brutality is bad in this matchup. So good to know. Uh, all right, looking at this hand, it has an energy flux, and that's usually going to be good enough. Especially the Black Lotus it means that at turn one I can slam an energy flux. I don't. <laughs> I, I would have to like look at deck lists again, but I don't think there's anything in there that stops it. So I, would, I, I can't imagine I don't just slam energy flux turn one, and then just like get have several several turns to figure out how to win. Um, it really, it, it's it's kind of wild how much this matchup is about this one card, um, in a way that a lot of times other things are not like match a lot of matchups it's like yeah it's all about this one card but really it's like uh, expressive iteration is the key to the match because it unlocks value and lots of cards unlocked value here it's really like energy flux or bust from my side unless i wanted to try to go for a fast win um, but looking at this obviously there's nothing super pressing here uh, he has lots of lands so eventually he can get to the point where energy flux isn't going to completely wreck his day but it's going to be something like turn six is probably where uh is some where it feels like it has a possibility of uh, getting out from underneath it, and hopefully I can find a way to win before turn six. Um, so Gitaxian Probe, obviously a great card, draws me back into a mind twist. So like, I could mind twist here. I don't actually go for the energy flux, interesting. Maybe I just like realize there's nothing that immediately stops me, or I want to bait out the artifacts first before going for the energy flux. Um, I actually like that play now thinking about it, after pausing for a second. I think trying to get him to commit some artifacts to the board so that the energy flux isn't just a kind of passive threat but is actually an active threat feels like it's a good uh, it's a good way of winning the match so um here i can just like thinking about this i can feel my hand kind of like shaking in nervousness uh and i cannot imagine how i felt at the time but it probably felt very similar uh in all these matches i get super nervous because there's so many ways to screw things up especially playing not in paper where i I'm less comfortable. I just, like, don't... I, I don't feel as comfortable in Cockatrice, so... Black Lotus, still a good card after all these years. Uh, luckily, this one is a legal back, so we can play on this format. And uh, I assume this is an Energy Flux. It could just be a Let's Mind Twist You for four cards, but, man, like, doing all these things... He has five cards in hand. Yep, okay, so that's what I'm doing. Energy Flux, uh, Mind Twisting down to... Uh, to one card there's no one card or no two cards that he could draw at this point that would end my day no that's not even true he could he could have drawn the time vault and then draw a key and that would be enough to kill me so i really don't love this this play um, obviously it'd be like a super unlikely scenario it would have to be a um, a one in five to keep the one card that mattered and then whatever one in 30 card to, to top deck it but i just don't i don't see a way to lose after casting the energy flux here so I don't, I don't know. I, the mind twist feels too cute to me, honestly. 
Um, I have an offer you can't refuse, but no matter to use it. So yeah, no, I, I really don't. I, I, I don't think it's, I think it's super unlikely I lose. Like something like a one in a hundred something, 150 maybe, but it still just doesn't feel like it's worth the risk uh, to do that. But hindsight 2020. Um, I'd also have to like for sure scour the list to make sure that I'm right about those assumptions, that there's nothing that actually takes out energy flux. But looking at it at first blush, I don't I don't see a, a re reason not to just cast it. So let's see. Yep, and then this is the let's see how long you can you can keep your artifacts alive um, using mana vault to pay for mox opal probably, uh, and I believe energy flux is actually sacrifice. Yeah, so energy flux gets around the silver uh, silver bluff bridge indestructible clause, uh, and. Yeah, it's it's a okay, cool. So paying for both of those two, um, but this 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 game is going to come down very quickly to zero permanence in play. Um, I I think that there's like I, I don't see a way out of this from the other side of the table at this point, but um, I, I certainly don't know this deck nearly as well. And I, there's with an infinite uh, with so many infinite ways to make mana on the deck, it wouldn't surprise me if I'm missing something for sure. Uh, Thank you, Team Neem. I appreciate the typewriter shoutouts. There's a couple of them here. One of them's made of Legos. One of them's real. I'll leave it to you to try to guess which one is which. And drawing the Death Wish. Uh, there's a Tormod's Crypt that could theoretically kind of make my day a little harder if I like go a little too committed here. I have my graveyard currently has my Black Lotus and Ketaxian Pro Barty in it, which are like two ways to make the Yawgmoth's Well in the Hand good. And also ways to make the Doomsday good. So, like, if a Tormod's Crypt hits the board from Jukens' side, uh, it makes my life a little bit harder. But, again, kind of, like, he has to draw so many basics in a row to keep permanence on the battlefield that it's just hard to, to not happen. Uh, here I am casting a spell, Demonic Tutor. So Demonic Tutor, getting Dark Ritual, just kind of, like, accelerating into a big Yawgmoth's Will is the plan here. Um... So next turn, I can go Ritual, Yawgmoth's Will, Ritual, do or Ritual, um, Black Lotus, and then Demonic Tutor into Doomsday, maybe, or maybe get Cabal Ritual. Uh, yeah, I don't know. There, there's got like maybe Cabal Ritual into Death Wish into some kill. Um, we're not we're not looking at any kind of uh, we're not looking at any kind of like. Mind break traps or anything like here. I've been watching way too many of Brian Cook's videos, just thinking about all the weird stuff he plays around. Here, that's the beauty and curse of VRD, as you know every card in your opponent's deck. Um, so I know I know what to be able to play around, which is very nice, especially online. Like online, you can actually access deck lists during games, which is something that you can't really do on paper. Uh, in most places, at least in, in, at Saint Lotus, you can't do on paper. Um, okay, so Yogmoth's will running it back down to zero mana, so uh, Black Lotus is going to be casting that dem or Dark Ritual, very likely. And so we are up to five, six, seven mana. Uh, seven mana into... That's enough for Death Wish into... Um, Death Wish into t Tendrils, but we only have uh, four Storm right now, so that's not going to be nearly enough. Uh, an offer you can't refuse can generate some free mana. Um, if I had been thinking about it, I might have offered you... Oh, no, I didn't have the Pact, so I couldn't do the, the uh, offer you can't refuse in a Pact. But this this line's pretty good. Going for the Doomsday instead. Um, the Doomsday can get opened up by this uh, Getaxian Probe. One interesting thing is that once you cast Yawgmoth's Will, your life gets a lot harder with Doomsday because now this Demonic Tutor and... Uh, more importantly, the Black Lotus and Dark Ritual are exiled permanently. I can't pick those cards with the Doomsday. So I'll use the Gataxian Probe to draw into the Doomsday pile. But from that point, the Gataxian Probe is gone. Uh, I need to figure out a way to win. Um, having Gush left in the deck makes it a lot easier. So I still have two mana. Uh, this should just be a Gush into a couple Cyclers into a Thassa's Oracle. But the mana is actually pretty tight here. Um, Gush is going to give, uh, we can go Gush into Lotus Petal and Cycler, 
So something like a Brainstorm could be an option or Conjurer's Bauble. Uh, I don't see, I'm not running Street Wraith because of Ad Nauseam. I'm not running Edge of Autumn for, because it's a terrible card. Um, so yeah, I actually don't, there's not like the immediately obvious pile that you often will see. So Gush draws into Lotus Petal. That's plus one mana. So I have then three mana available. I have not played a land, I don't think. No, I I, I did not play a land because I still have three lands in play, which is the same number we had from that uh, Energy Flux. So we can replay off the Gush. So yeah, I think we can use Knight's Whisper. Uh, we can go get Taxi and Probe, or Gush into Lotus Petal and Knight's Whisper. Knight's Whisper into the last, into cards three and four, and then just cast the Thassa's Oracle as one of the th cards three or four, leaving one card left in the library. And there's probably a perfect pile that gets down to zero, but... Um, that that's that's perfectly fine given that we know there's no instant speed interaction in our opponent's hand from both uh knowing deck lists and also from having studied over the um from having from looking at the deck list and also having mind twisted up, up previously as well um also attack or the Cataxian probe revealed that turn that there were what exactly was going on there so we didn't have to worry about getting out to exactly zero cards all right and game three being on the on the draw is a little harder of course um, this hand, oh, tons of interaction, but not really much going on. Uh, the Collective Brutality is still sitting there in hand, uh, feeling pretty bad looking back on it, knowing how terrible it is in this matchup, given that it can, it can hit like zero cards. I don't know. Let's see. It can hit something, I'm sure, but it's really not going to hit much. It can hit Transmute Artifact, and that's it. So, Transmute Artifact, not the real clutch card of this matchup that we have to worry about. So, uh, yeah, this is how we this is how we learn, this is how we get better, this is how we learn to stop playing bad cards. Um, I actually don't know, it, it, looking at this draft, if I would have taken Collector Brutality, given what I know about it now, versus, um, I don't know, some other, some card that can be a little more interactive. Um, obviously, Duress and IOK and all the other cards went uh, went very late this draft, so I had kind of a lot of other options. I ended up getting Duress, uh, but I think they're probably a better card than Collective Brutality, um, just especially given like there are only two or three Counterspell decks. But uh, here it looks like Jukems went down to six. I am, I guess, keeping this hand. Man, this one's. A not a good hand. Uh, it's really kept off the back of a Cataxian Pro plus Mind Twist, uh, and Gush. Gush will, I mean, be a value card in this in this hand. Uh, where turn three, I can gush into another land drop. Um, but he, I, I don't think I would keep this uh, in the dark anymore. Um, but maybe that's too conservative. Maybe Chain of Vapor is a good enough card that I can I can use that to float for a while. Uh, Chain of Vapor, notably in my deck, doesn't do the cute things it does in a lot of legacy decks where you can bounce your own artifacts and things like that, or you see this in Vintage a lot. Um, all of my artifacts that generate mana, other than Chrome Mox, are all sacrificed as part of the cost. So, uh, or sorry, Chrome Mox isn't even mine, is it? I don't think I have Chrome Mox. No, Chrome Mox is mine. So I can use Chrome Mox, but that's obviously a pretty painful uh, man uh, card cost to do so. Jukem starting off with the Zerda. Uh, I think... Did I put... Um, maybe I put my companion in the deck for this one? I'd have to relook at that. Uh, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Because this is the one matchup where Energy Flux uh, means that I can't play. Uh, I cannot play with Lurus as the companion. So Energy Flux is in the main deck, so everything's about Energy Flux. This is where, like, with this hand, I, I feel like you have to have a better hand if you mulligan two of six. Um... Seeing Jukems, there's a there's a key in an opal. Hand is Mystic Forge and Basalt Monolith, so uh, not close to Zerda at the moment, but also not infinitely far away. Having a land into a, drawing a, drawing a Serum Visions there seems incredibly strong to me. Um, then drawing the Wishclaw Talisman is also really great because that means I have a, now a clear path to the uh, to the Energy Flux. However, uh, notably, Pithy Needle can still take out the Wishclaw Talisman. I don't actually know how Jukem sided, though. Pithy Needle might still be in the board for Karn. Um, I, 
those kind of card decks are really tricky to sideboard, so I don't envy anybody playing them. But trying to decide what actually comes in versus stays in your wish board is, is tough, um, especially with so many main deck artifact tutors. I guess not so many main deck tutors, but there's, there are artifact tutors in the main deck. Um, so being able to just shut down a wish Claw talisman is not out of the question. Uh, so Serum Visions, I stacked stacked the cards. It looks like Yawgmoth's Will uh, goes down to the bottom of the library. So not able to use that one right now, given that I have zero fast mana. Um, I do have the three lands lined up, which is nice. So I guess this is just kind of turn two, slam the Wish Claw, and pray uh, that I get a turn three. But nothing's really stopping that right now. There's a, certainly a chance of uh, him just dropping a... Uh, dropping a time vault and me losing. That's not out of the question by any means. Uh, and if I'm pretty dumb, I'm probably gonna think this collective brutality can stop that play, so I might just go for that play. We'll see what happens. But um, yeah, uh, I think this might be where I'm reading the card. Hopefully I don't cast it, but we'll find out if I if I cast it uh, or if I just say, Let's screw it, move on. Uh, playing it untapped, good. Playing the Wish Claw Talisman, this means that I'm choosing not to leave up Chain of Vapor and basically just praying that there's no uh, no Time Vault here. Um, again, a more conservative play might be to leave up the Chain of Vapor. I don't know what's correct. Given that I have a third land, I actually think I would now, in hindsight, leave up Chain of Vapor. But again, that's super conservative, and I'm aware of that. I just I hate, I hate leaving out these chances of getting got, which is absolutely possible here. I know that... Uh, I know there's three cards, one of them is unknown. So there's a Basalt Model with Mystic Forge. It could be another land in hand, it, which is exactly what it was. So it could have been land into Time Vault, um, which would feel pretty pretty bad. Oh no, okay, so the Aether Spellbomb got cashed in for a, uh, got cashed in for a land. Okay, so no, I, I actually take that back. I didn't, I did know that there was no chance of going land into Time Vault there. Yeah, there, there it is. You kind of saw it before I did. Uh, So, then untapping with the Wish Claw Talisman should be enough to be able to slam the Energy Flux, but we'll see. I don't see a better... Ooh, I, apparently I do see a better option. Oh, I don't have enough mana to do that. <laughs> uh, never not lucky, I guess, drawing the Black Lotus. That solves the problems. Uh, because, obviously, Wish Claw Talisman costs one to activate, which means that I could go find the Energy Flux, but I wouldn't have had enough mana previously to be able to use it this turn as well. But drawing the Chrome Mox and Black Lotus solves that problem in a couple ways. And, yeah. So, let's see. I, this is, at this point, feels like, assuming that we're correct on the matchup, that Energy Flux is an unbeatable card. Um, especially given it in the spot that we're in right now. Uh, of note, Jukems is still going to be left with two mana this time, as opposed to last game where there was, like, nothing. Uh, so there's still, we're still playing with a live rattlesnake here. It's not like it's, it's not like a complete shutout. Um, there are cards that could make my day substantially worse, and we're also handing him a wish claw talisman. Obviously, he's probably not going to pay for the wish claw talisman, but that's something to be aware of. Uh, a cute thing that can happen here, though, is that if wish claw talisman dies, I can use Yawgmoth's will to get it back from the graveyard as, as kind of a uh, as a three mana tutor. Um, not going to be super relevant given that if I have enough mana to cast Yawgmoth's Will into a Wish Claw Talisman and activate it from the graveyard, things are probably going really well for me. But just something to be of note, it does go back to your own graveyard and you can recast it. So, um, but yeah, does the I do the predictable play, uh, Black Lotus into Energy Flux, um, and yeah, this is just a it's a it's what the matchup's about. So, uh, I I think Energy Flux is undervalued in general like i think it, i don't know when exactly it gets picked let's see uh let's ask our friendly neighborhood ninth seed about when it gets picked uh apologies for the loud keyboard i'm still working on mic setup stuff um i generally take it around like pick 20 but yeah pick 28 is where it went here and i don't know i think it really depends on your field but if you have like a blue red artifact deck or some kind of like heavy um some kind of heavy artifact theme even one or one to two of those decks i think energy flux is just like a slam dunk especially because there's so many blue decks that might want it it that because those kind of things really push it up the pick order compared to something like a veil of summer uh that 
is also a really good card, but is wanted by far fewer decks. There's only one or two green decks that could want that card in the average field. Um, Jukems does use the Wish Claw on his own turn, and uh, using it before the Energy Flux trigger, of course. So that's, that's a cute way to get around this. It means that I have to choose to pay for it or not, and very likely I'm going to just use it to go get another card, hand it back uh, with zero counters on it. Uh, Mox Opal is going to pay for itself, uh, and there's a Tolarian Academy in play. Obviously, that's the exact turn after he probably wanted it, um, but Tolarian Academy still kind of gives him the chance of building up and slamming stuff quickly. Um, his deck, kind of like, like all these decks in this format, is a lot harder to play a bunch of zeros. He has an LED uh, that is a zero cost, obviously, and the Tolarian Academy effectively makes all of his one drops free. So, not under the woods, but it, it gets pretty tough to come back in the spot. Let's see. Uh, I don't see a way, and this is where it's kind of like, from this spot, I really want to try to close the game out as quickly as possible, because I see that there's, like, lines to lose. But it's also uh, in the spot where you're kind of, like, in an 80% position to win. It feels really bad to be taking a ton of time and then going into the tank especially with a Doomsday deck where you know you're doing that a lot. It just feels really bad. And I don't I don't know, like, <laughs> I, don't, I don't know how to, like, be polite during a match while also, like, saying, no, there's a very real chance I could lose. Uh, and, and that's where I, I'm sure that if I were smarter, I could have come up with a fast line and be able to win this turn or next turn. Uh, but staring at this, I don't see it right now. Um, there's a real desire to just value gush here. Uh... But I tutoring, what do you go for? Do you go for the Doomsday? Yeah, Doomsday feels like the right choice, given that I should be able to get other mana, but I actually don't know what the other mana would necessarily uh, be right away. But right now I don't have it. I have, uh, like, we're pretty far from being able to cast Doomsday. Um, I think the play is just Knight's Whisper, just to draw two cards and then leave up the island for the Chain of Vapor. Uh, you could also just empty the hands, but man. Yeah, so firing out the Mind Twist uh, for two. Killing the Karn is a big one. That's That definitely makes my life substantially easier. Uh, and killing the Mystic Force, so we know there's a Basalt Monolith left in hand. Um, Basalt Monolith plus Tolarian Academy aren't necessarily best friends, but they're pretty, they're pretty close friends. Uh, okay, thanks Spambot, appreciate you stopping by. Let's make you go away. Somehow. Do, 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 do. Always fun dealing with Twitch. Uh, somehow. You. Let's block you. Good. All right, so back to the match, sorry about that. Uh, and, so let's see, there's a Wish Call Talisman to the graveyard. Uh, Great Furnace got played and is paying, and Mox Opal got paid for by the Talarian Academy. Uh, handing the Wish Call Talisman, interestingly, gave him an extra mana. Um, okay, so still pretty far from a Doomsday. I guess I could technically cast Doomsday this turn. You could go Chrome Mox, Imprinting, Knight's Whisper, Gush, Returning the Watery Grave, cast Doomsday going down to, what, seven? Yep, that seems, sure seems like what I'm doing. Uh, this feels aggressive to me. I don't know. Maybe, maybe it's the right choice, but it feels like trying to just cl close the door. Um, and maybe uh, someone smart. Oh no, okay, so I, I actually can draw into the Doomsday with the Sleight of Hand as well. Uh, an offer you can't refuse doesn't do a whole lot. But no, draw, drawing in with the Sleight of Hand means that this can just go into a second Gush, uh, which should win the game. So you can go Gush into Black Lotus and Knight's Whisper, drawing into Lotus Petal and... Uh, some one mana card, uh, Conjurer's Bauble, and then the last card is Thassa's Oracle. So no, this this is a this is a pretty easy, uh, perfect Thassa's Oracle win. 
um, playing with Gush, it's just like compared to Legacy Doomsday, where it's just obviously in a pretty strong spot in the meta game right now. Um, it is a, uh, it is it, playing with Gush just makes Doomsday so much easier, and it's kind of like playing Vintage where you can play Ancestral Recall. It's the same thing, even one step beyond this. But man, it feels like cheating to be able to play with Gush. Uh, just being able to draw two cards for free is just completely wild. Uh, so, let's see, which pile did I go for here? Okay, I used a Serum Vision. Oh, okay, I used a Gitaxian Probe. All right, so I didn't go for the Night's Whisper play at all here. I um, just did Gush, Gitaxian Probe, Serum Vision is going to draw into Black Lotus. Okay, so what's the order here then? Gush and Lotus Probe. Serum Vision shouldn't be on the bottom there, bro. Come on, what are you doing? What is, what is happening here? Cadaxium Probe second. Okay, Lotus and Oracle top. Am I doing something cute with like... Oh, I need to use Sleight of Hand to put it on the bottom, of course. That's what's happening there. I need to use Sleight of Hand to put one of the cards on bottom. So Thassa's Oracle is going to be the one that I just put on bottom with the Sleight of Hand to then be able to draw into it with the other ones. That makes sense. Uh, these cantrips are wild. I just like... I, I don't like playing this deck. It's too hard. Uh, it's just, it's, it's not even hard, right? It's just like there's so many ways to be able to screw up and lose. Um, like if I had just built the pile set I was going to build right now, um, obviously I'm not in the same mind state I was then. I don't know the deck as well. But if I had just done that, then all of a sudden I lose because uh, what, now I was under the cantrip sitting on the bottom. And I don't think it actually loses given that the Thassa's Oracle doesn't have to be perfect, but it's still like these kind of, those kind of real sloppy plays that are very easy to make by accident with this deck. Um, and they can be pretty brutal if you do it wrong. So, um, okay, so Jukem's is conceding here. So there's a Basalt model showing me the last card in hand. Uh, and let's pull up the last game. So that matchup felt uh, super different than most of the matchups we've seen, right? Obviously, uh, not having the. Uh, yeah, just not, not having not having to like play for the fast win, but instead playing for a slower um, a slower speed win where you're going to try to win through a energy flux effectively as, instead of winning off of a fast combo. It's just a super different matchup, but um, really great games. Chukems was nothing but class, of course, and it was uh, it was a fun matchup all around. Even though it is a really different one, just kind of using a bunch of tutors to find your one. Uh, so that cyber card, right? Basically, spending a cyber card, spending a cyber pick to be a silver bullet and completely shut down a deck is a pretty aggressive thing to do. Obviously, you don't have that many picks, but have, if you have one card that can shore up one matchup and make it a very different matchup, it can be pretty strong. So, uh, last one that we're going to be talking about. Uh, I am seeing stream quality a little lower. Okay, no, it's coming through fine. It was just that one. Um, cool. Things look good. Uh, the the last ma this last matchup is going to be against Hyphen. Hyphen is playing uh, blue green creature beat down stuff. Um, but notably, if we look at those instant section, there's a lot of really scary things for me. This is the double force matchup. There's also a mana drain. Um, there's lots of things to be scared about in game one in this matchup. Uh, even things like uh, Vendillion Click are really painful given that my sideboard discard strategy involves duress. So duress can't hit Vendillion Click. Uh, collective Brutality can't hit Vendillion Click. Um, there's just like a lot of ways to really get screwed up in this matchup. Uh, and the clock is, is not slow. Having Hex Drinker as a win condition can be pretty strong. Uh, and there's Acceleration given the Ignoble Hierarch, Noble Hierarch, and Birds of Paradise. So lots of ways to just like have a random natural order kill me. Um, one card that I, th I really like seeing out of this list is Pest Infection. I think this is a card that people don't play as often because it's kind of like not as, I don't know, it's, it's not the standard one compared to whatever the the, uh, the new version of an, uh, the destroy an enchantment or artifact that you often will see from people that leaves a creature in play. Um, being a sorcery can be better and having be able to option to destroy more targets can also be good, but at its core it's kind of very similar to that, that creature. Um, so 
yeah, there's just like lots, lots of things here. This is a matchup where both I want to get artifacts onto the table to test the instance to make sure I actually can get them to play, but I also don't want to put them to play to put them in risk of pest infection or pest infestation, killing them. There's a temporal spring, which makes things like Wish Claw Talisman a lot more dangerous. Uh, Upheaval feels like a card that I don't think matters in this matchup, given that it, it's kind of like a reset button and he has fast mana, but I have fast mana too, so I don't think that's really going to be the card that's going to determine where things go. Um, and then out of the sideboard, uh, Demonic Consultation is obviously the card that uh, Hyphen took from me. It makes it would have made my deck, I think, better. Uh, I definitely thought at the time that it would make my deck better. I was pretty frustrated with losing it, but I, looking at it, I think Death Wish makes it more versatile, even though it makes it slower. Uh, so I actually don't know which one's better, but Coming out of the sideboard, there is a Mana Leak and a Miscast, uh, and Endurance, all of which Mana Leak and Miscast are obviously much better, but uh, Endurance and Scavenging News don't do nothing. I'm not, I don't know if I actually want them in this matchup, if I'm, if I'm, if I'm a uh, hyphen, but maybe. Um, Veil of Summer shuts down Tendrils. It doesn't, it does, uh, it also shuts down Brain Freeze. So Veil of Summer stops, uh, stops two of my three win conditions, uh, and if, if he can get rid of the, if he can get rid of the Thassa's Oracle, it can shut down all my win conditions. So it's a potentially a pretty strong card, especially given that I have a lot of discard spells. He also took one of my favorite cyborg cards ever in Seed Time. Um, probably not super good in this matchup, given that I'm not going to be casting a lot of instants on his turn. But still, great card. Uh, these artifact spells are probably not for me. So yeah, I think mostly it's. Just counter spells is what I need to be worried about. So this is going to be a match of, of all about discard spells and kind of getting a fast enough combo, um, hopefully with a pact of negation protection. Let's go and see what happens. So this one started. We started already a little into the match. Sorry about that. Um, Hex Drinker is already in play. I got to go first, it looks like. I went island, nothing. Uh, and I was on a Dramalta 6, it looks like. Yeah, I was on a Molta 6. Um, so this brainstorm is pretty freaking good, given that that's a dark ritual into a doomsday, uh, and it might also be dark ritual into doomsday into vamp. Does vamp do anything? No, vamp does nothing in that scenario. Um, I don't know. Do you go dark ritual doomsday? You could also go, let's see, dark rituals three, lotus petals four, yogmoth's will is down to one, up to two up to four that does nothing okay good yep there's a good ball ritual too uh so up to five up to six is there anything that six does for you that four do no you have no way to draw into your pile um so you know tons of mana uh and uh, and two top deck tutors effectively with vampiric and doomsday uh you could go for Luris. is there anything with Luris here that's interesting you can cast a lotus petal you can go dark ritual Luris, Lotus Petal, Recast Lotus Petal, Vampiric. I think that's better than going all out for this Doomsday. So I think I would go for that. I'm going to go Dark Ritual into Luris. I choose to do nothing. Okay, interesting. Um, I mean, there there is a Force of Will and a Force of Negation and a uh, and a Mana Drain. So Mana Drain wasn't relevant, obviously, but a Force of Will was super relevant. I think I like the Luris. Oh, Luris just goes to hand. I'm sorry. You can't cast Luris in the Companion Zone anymore. Uh, so, no. I could have gone Dark Ritual into Luris to hand, but that's obviously not very good. So, that's not what this match was about. Hyphen crashes in with the Hex Drinker again, uh, taking me down to... Or, just for the first time, taking me down to 16. Um, I'm leaving up the Vampiric on his end step, uh, which seems fine, because given that he has to tap out to get the Hex Drinker bigger... Um, we'll see if there's a force coming, but probably not. You don't usually want to force the Vampiric Tutor. Uh, Black Lotus is the obvious grab, but that doesn't draw a card, so maybe I go for something that's a little uh, a little more grindier value-based. Like, somebody could argue for a Mystic Remora, but that can't be right to me. Uh, but Pact of Negation. Pact of Negation I love, actually. This is great. This means I can go, I can do that same line I was talking about before, but have some modicum of protection for it, which is pretty nice. Uh, and... The, the obviously bad thing about Vampiric is that you're not going to be able to draw another card this turn. So, um, But yeah, we have two mana. Uh, can just cast Dark Ritual Doomsday. If that gets countered, though, I can't use Pact to defend it this turn. I have to use it to defend the Doomsday the turn after. 
Um, so I don't, mm, this is, this is interesting. Do you just check and make sure he has it? Uh, it's literally just force of will and force of negation are the only two cards that you're scared of right now. Um, but five cards left in hand, being willing to tap over a hex drinker, like those are pretty strong signals. Is miscast main deck? Miscast is not main deck. Okay. Um, yeah, this is a tough call. I genuinely don't know what I would do looking at this right now. Uh, I think I would have thought about that vampiric a little more. I'm pretty sure about that because Pact of Negation doesn't protect this. So it puts you in this really awkward spot. Uh, you're here on turn three. Um, but I also don't love going for Black Lotus. I don't know. Yeah, I really don't know what, what I would do right here. But being able to vampiric and then just passing the turn feels pretty bad. I don't know. <laughs> I, I don't know immediately what, but I, I, I would feel way better about this if I had an extra land. I didn't have to use the dark ritual to break into this to break into this thing, or if I had a cantrip that I could use to break into a pile this turn, um, because then you can use Pact of Negation to defend your Doomsday because you have a way to draw into it. But really, it's like you need a cantrip or you need a, a land to make this a little less aggressive. Okay, so Hex Drinker's grown uh, and now has this skull clamp on it as well. So. Hex Drinker says two on there. It's obviously bigger than that. Uh, Wish Claw Talisman. Eesh. I mean, that's fine. It means that I can go for the turn after this. But I'm getting beat down pretty hard. Next turn is really my last turn in this game. Uh, I don't know what I'm looking at there. So... Yeah, I mean, I guess you just go for Wish Claw Talisman. Oh, no. It's, okay, we're still... What's happening now? Okay, he's showing the Hex Drinker differently, I think. But, yeah, I don't know. This is just... I, I have to think that the Vampiric into Pact play was should have been thought through more. I don't know what exactly you go for there. Um, you can't really play scared in these matchups either. Like You're going to have to make him do it at some point. But getting the Wish Claw out here to test feels like a good one. Uh, I like I like I like this because it's a it's nearly a must counter, um, and if it's not a must counter, then it wins us the game, right? Like if he he would have to have uh, the four cards be specifically force force blue card, uh, or maybe managing force blue card as three of the four. Like there's just so few cards that beat us even in the dark right now. Um, oh, I'm just I'm just going for it because I guess Wish Claw can find the Gataxian probe to unlock the pile now. Yeah, okay. This this is pretty good. Uh, good. Good job past me. You're being a lot smarter than me. Uh, okay, so Dark Ritual, we're at Storm 3. We have 3 mana floating. Using Wish Claw going down to 2 mana. Uh, the Wish Claw is almost assuredly going to be finding some way to break into this Doomsday pile. Nope. Finding Black Lotus, right? Because I, I need I need the... Uh, I need the 3 mana to cast the Doomsday. Um, okay. 2 mana. Black Lotus is being cast. Storm 4. Black Lotus can then cast Yawgmoth's Will, uh, which can unlock the graveyard. Once again, doing the awkward um, Doomsday without Black Lotus issue. Um, also, no, now I'm committed, right? If, I, if, if things fizzle out from here, I have no way to recur the graveyard. Um, there's the Force of Will exiling Oko. Oko is obviously a super strong card, but not at all what this matchup is about. Pact of Negation for the Force of Will. Uh, really, I, I can get completely screwed here if I don't, uh, if he has the Force of Negation, which luckily it did not. So we get, get our Storm Count all the way up here. And at this point, we have a pretty clean Doomsday using Brainstorm to break out the pile because Yawgmoth's Will can allow that to get recast. So we have... Four mana, seven mana, eight mana effectively. Uh, this is just a pretty clean Doomsday into Brainstorm. And because the Pact of Negation happened before the Doomsday resolved, Pact of Negation is also here to defend this thing. So if for some reason he wanted to sandbag the other force, uh, I don't have to worry about that because Pact of Negation has to be covered. Um, and there's no green mana up for the Veil. Nope, this is game one. It <laughs> doesn't matter for that. Uh, but in game two or things like that, you have to be really worried if they leave a forest up because that could be signaling the veil. 
um, and you have to go for the Thassa's Oracle kill at that point versus the uh, versus just using the standard the storm kill. Let's accelerate this a little bit. I don't know exactly what's happening here. Do, 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 do. What am I thinking about? Got all the mana in the world. Vivi versus Chatty. Casting Vampiric. Okay. Okay. Uh, maybe there is something I'm not seeing here. Vampiric finding Death Wish. Okay, I guess maybe, maybe it's that I can't, the Doomsday, I have no way to get more mana from. Um, because if you cast Doomsday, you're going to have to use some of these, th this other mana, uh, and your pile gets a little constricted. No, th that should have been fine. I don't know what I'm doing here. Uh, I think I'm just like in my own head about it, but there's there's like three ways to win from here. Um, but Death Wish is a fine one, right? I have... Uh, the three mana for Death Wish into enough mana to cast uh, into enough mana to cast the uh, Brain Freeze, which is Storm Counts at twelve already. So we're way way above the threshold where we need to be to kill him. Um, maybe I was just looking at sideboard or looking at main deck to make sure there are no Drowsy Titans in the main deck. That's an option. Is like if there if there were an Emberpool or something sitting there, I wouldn't be able to go for the Brain Freeze kill, and I was one mana short of being able to do the Tendrils kill. Unless I'm miscounting, but no. Okay, that, that's exactly what I was doing. I was probably checking to make sure there was no, nothing that beat a brain freeze. Because um, there's also some weird stuff where like endurance can beat a brain freeze, where they endurance themselves, I believe, is an option. Uh, let's see, target player, yeah. So you can, they, uh, against an endurance player in particular in games two and three, you don't want to go for a brain freeze kill, even though it's a pretty low chance of happening. Uh, yeah. Okay, but... Got there game one. That was good. Uh, the pretty aggressive clock on that Hex Drinker. And uh, I can see why he went for it, right? He had a Force of Will in hand that makes it a lot more palatable to be able to push the Hex Drinker into play uh, and kind of make it a big enough threat. Um, but th there's a lot of, like, the Hex Drinker both created a fast clock but also really restricted options, right? There were no other elves or anything there kind of being able to threaten extra mana. Um, the Skull Clamp didn't have anything to eat because the Hex Drinker was the only thing on the field. Uh, I don't know. I mean, obviously, pressuring my deck on time is about the best thing you can do, but it, it just didn't work out in that matchup because one force of will is often not enough to beat this deck. Uh, the It has a ton of ways of interacting, as you can see. So bringing in Collective Brutality is good in this matchup because it kills mana elves as well as uh, removing the instants. So like seeing this Collective Brutality. Swan Song is obviously really strong. Uh, and Hope of Gearper is a slam dunk in all these in, in all these counterspell decks. It's just like a bonkers card. I, I really like. I understand why it doesn't get as much play because pure combo decks are generally not very good in VRD. But once you are kind of into a deck that says I'm going to win on a combo, having Hope of Gearper is just like it makes your life so much easier. Because in all these matchups, they're going to take out their like I was a creatureless deck, right? The only creature in my deck is is Luris in the main deck. So they're not going to have any um, creature hate in the later in the later matches. The only thing you have to worry about is artifact hate. Um, and my deck, again, doesn't really present any artifacts. Wishclaw Talisman is about the only one that will stick out there. Sometimes a Chrome Box, but in general, like there's nothing there to really kill with artifact hate. So artifact hate and creature hate are both pretty dead cards. Um, the Stunning Reversal card I really love, but it's, it's just not very good. I wish it were good, but uh, it's, it is better in this matchup than it is in most, where you can... Uh, engineer a time where them, them creator hooking you means that you get to draw a fresh hand, but it's just like so rare, and you're also trying to play it into counter spells. It's just like it's a mess. I think stunning reversal could be good in a near mono blue deck where you're running uh, tons of counter spells yourself, and you can kind of like use your counter spells to defend your stunning reversal. But at that point, you're leaving up five mana, and it's just like I don't know. You got to run like a factor fiction deck or something, which I've not seen really work in VRD. I like taking out the Imperial Seal. I like taking out the Wishclaw Talisman, given all the artifact hate we saw from the other side of the board. Um, I think there's an argument for taking out Yawgmoth's Will, given the Endurance, but that's just like such a powerful card that it's probably worth keeping anyway. Uh, scanning through other cards on the sideboard to be particularly worried about. Uh, miscast is annoying. Yeah, I don't know. There's there's like lots of graveyard and artifact hate that's going to be coming in. Mental note coming out is it seems super clean to me. That's just like one of the worst cards in the deck. So mental note is a pretty easy one to come out. Imperial Seal will be another option. 
Um, those are kind of the two worst cards in the deck, I think. Lurus, luckily we get to keep in as a companion this one, because we don't play Energy Flux, which is the only card in the 75, or whatever, 45, that is over two mana. So having Lurus as an option in these kind of matchups is super nice, especially given that he's a creature deck and he's going to be crushing in life total. The lifelink on Lurus, like, spending six mana for a 3-2 lifelinker is actually, like, pretty fair in this deck. It happens more than you would think. Um, I think we already have seen it two or three times. Um, it's just, like, a pretty bad card, but you know what? Sometimes you need life for ad nauseum, and this is one way to get it. Uh, I like this hand. Chrome Mox is almost certainly going to imprint one of these black cards. Uh, we're pretty we're pretty close to the ad nauseum. If we draw a black lotus, we have a turn one ad nauseum. Uh, if we draw a black, if we draw a dark ritual, we have a turn two ad nauseum. Like all these options are pretty great. Um, Death Wish is a card that's super scary to exile because it means you're all in on your Thassa's Oracle, but it might be the right choice. Uh, so imprinting ad nauseum ooh man it, it feels bad uh, i see why i did it being able to collect a brutality killing a hex drinker and ripping apart their hand is just like such a brutal play especially given that he's committed the mana crypt to the board um so yeah using those two modes has to be the right choice just killing it killing a hex drinker especially one that's already had mana pumped into it is just like one of the most demoralizing things you can do hex drinker of course uh brandon curry is almost certainly going to have one of his players draft this card at the VRD on the 14th, but it's uh, it's just such a powerful card, uh, and it's a personal favorite of his. So being able to rip that mana drain out of his hand, which is pretty clutch. Terrastodon, Noble Hierarch, and Skull Clamp, all fine. Um, this Noble Hierarch in the Skull Clamp play is going to refill the hand a little bit, but like Terrastodon's not doing anything that's match up. That's a, that is a natural order target. Um, that's not something I need to worry about for a very long time right now. Let's see. So Noble Hierarch, Skull Clamp, almost assuredly clamping the Hierarch uh, to find a second land. No, okay, not actually. So leaving, uh, we know Terastodon plus one unknown card in hand. Maybe this is a double blue card? Nope, there's mana, mana leak. I don't know. Yeah, I can't think of a reason not to do it, but I certainly don't know this. So now we get Lurus in our hand. It's pretty exciting. It means it's, I'm going to be playing for the grindy matchup here. Whenever I take Lurus in, it means I anticipate the game lasting like two to three more turns. Uh, I don't think, I don't remember what the other card is in the graveyard here before the Collector Brutality. I discarded Takanuma. So the Takanuma in the graveyard, so Lurus can get that back, I'm pretty sure. Let me just reread what Lurus says here, because that card never gets played. You may cast one permanent spell. No, so I cannot cast Takanuma back, um, which means that the only source of black I have is this Curl Mox. A little scary given all the artifact hate uh, and given how reliant this deck is on black. But, say Livy, um, I have both of my win conditions in my hand, so if somebody were to make me discard twice, I would be riding a lot of will on this Yawgmoth's will. Uh, Pact of Negation, pretty bad at this point in the game. Uh, and notably, I can't cast Lurus, which is not great. So Conjurer's Bauble. Uh, I don't want either of those cards back on my deck, so probably going to leave them both in the graveyard for Yawgmoth's will in the future. And Blood Moon. Thank you, Jesus. Uh, being able to go find that Underground Sea is going to be really clutch here. We're not worried about Wasteland or Strip Mine, given that we know Hyphen's 75. Uh, and uh, just being able to get Alluras out this turn is going to be big. Uh, there's We have Conjurer's Bauble in the graveyard as well, so that won't be relevant this turn, but it will be really relevant in the future turns. Conjurer's Bauble means that every turn we get a free draw, uh, and that's going to be pretty nice. So... I think it's still worth exposing the Lurus, just saving that three mana is really important. And there's not a very high risk that Typhon still has any um, still has any creature hate in the deck. Uh, notably, Rafellos is pretty good, but with one land, not very strong. Uh, and the Mana Crypt is going to be bonking him for one and a half every turn. So Hyphen needs to be worried about uh, flipping. He rolled a 10, which I think is not any damage. So... Um, Odds are the numbers we're looking for for our side of the table. But Mana Crypt means that he can't sit around forever, but he does have a lot of mana right now. So he has uh, three there plus the one off Rafello. So if he plays a land, that means we're up to uh, we're up to six mana. So still not quite terrested on mana, but we could get there. Um, and my deck is sitting here kind of stalled out. So I can Death Wish. Uh, usually Death Wish is to find one of the conditions. I 
could death wish for something else i don't even know what's in my sideboard at this point um this is one of those like when sideboarding for this deck oftentimes you'll want to sideboard out a card that's situational so you could use it for death wish so something like that mental note is actually a card that it's nice to have a cantrip sitting in your board uh it sounds really weird that you'd pay four mana to use a cantrip but sometimes it's really nice to be able to use death wish to break into your doomsday pile if you are like super stacked on mana you could go dark rich or you could go demonic tutor De or you could cast doomsday into death wish into mental note to open your pile uh and it, it's that's something that you wouldn't be able to do game one so like a lot of the stuff gold fishing it you really have to think about uh you don't want to get locked into lines you're used to from gold fishing because in games two and three given that you're playing a wish your sideboard strategy just gets wildly different especially given that it's death wish and you grab any card like i mean like burning wish is a little easier to play with because you know exactly what sorceries exist um death wish is just like take whatever you want right you can get a basic land at any point because you have infinite of those in your sideboard uh, but anyway enough about pontificating about this we have Rafelos, which is currently making two plus two so we're at six mana over there uh ignoble hierarch just got clamped uh sitting with one mana still don't know a uh, sylvan library got put into play cool so we're under a lot of uh pressure in a bunch of ways right hyphen has a bunch of mana coming next turn theoretically up to eight mana uh, and then also is going to be drawing three cards plus a skull clamp, so kind of drawing up to five cards that he wants. Uh, things are super under pressure. Uh, and we have Pact Negation and Offer You Can't Refuse, which are great, uh, but this is one of those just like, I got four mana and one card draw in my graveyard if I want it. What can I go get out of the sideboard at this Death Wish? Uh, there's like... <laughs> Given that there's a, a Pact of Negation, you could make an argument for something like a Stunning Reversal, but that feels like super aggressive to me. Um, I don't see anything that jumps out immediately. Massacre obviously would slow things down a whole lot, but it's probably not the kind of slam dunk play that I'm looking for. Death Wishing for a Wish Claw is cute, but um, given, again, that we know Endurance is in, is in Hyphen's deck, probably... Uh, we can't necessarily commit to something like a brain freeze line with a low storm count because obviously we only need storm 12 to win off that uh, but it's just a lot riskier given that we know that there's a an endurance option so Luris comes crashing in gaining some life it would be really nice to be able to death wish for wish claw into ad nauseum right now but Death Wish plus Ad Nauseum is not really a great combo given that your life totally gets halved. So instead I just opt for the Conjurer's Bobble. Super lucky. Let's get a Black Lotus going. Black Lotus plus Luris is like, I think, what is that stage two or stage three of the deck? Is like, once you have Black Lotus, what can you do with it? Uh, get some tutors. Okay, now that you have tutors, Luris is pretty good with Black Lotus. Let's try that out. So, um, yeah, this is... <laughs> <laughs> Let's, I don't know exactly what it is, but we're getting real close to Death Wish into Wish Claw into Doomsday or something. Uh, also, an offer you can't refuse is just like such a strong card. Um, so being able to use it defensively this turn and the next turn use it offensively to be able to generate Storm Count can be really nice. You do something like uh, cast Black Lotus, cast an offer you can't refuse on the... Or sorry, cast Black Lotus, cast Pact of Negation, counter your own Pact of Negation with an offer you can't refuse generating uh two mana uh and then uh, so, so that actually gener that actually acts as a as a ritual so an offer you can't refuse if you counter a zero mana spell generates one mana um something that obviously we don't want to do here given that we know all the counter spells that exist in hyphen's deck but it's it's definitely a line that you need to be worried about when you are trying to calculate out storm counts here um mana we are we are sitting pretty righteous on mana. We have four plus the three off Black Lotus is seven, and then three more off the second cast of Black Lotus from Luris. So we're up to 10 mana next turn. Uh, effectively, uh, I don't know exactly how to do it yet, but Death Wish means that we have seven mana. Wish Claw means we have four mana. Uh, into doomsday nope we don't have a way of drawing given that we're using the luris for the lotus instead of the conjurer's bauble um uh, hmm you could sacrifice three of the mana and use the conjurer's bauble to get grab imperial seal off death wish 
that would be an option to then use Conjurer's Bubble to draw the Imperial Seal. Nope, that doesn't get you. Hmm, that, that doesn't get you into your pile either because you're still stuck with the Doomsday with no way to draw into it. Um, but let's see. <laughs> What's Hyphen doing? Hyphen's playing another forest, meaning there's eight mana. That's enough for a Terastodon. That seems pretty bad for me. Um, I could counter this. If I counter it, I just lose those, so probably don't want to do that because I don't have five mana next turn. So I think we should have to let the Terastodon happen. Um, of note, Hyphen's not at a super high life total. He's at 14, which means he probably can't give us nine power worth of creatures because then I could attack in for nine, um, which would then put him at five, uh, which would put him pretty close to being dead off a of mana crypt. Um, it's not like the nicest play in the world, but it's certainly one that is a little risky for him. So, yeah, I don't know. I think if I'm Hyphen, I probably want to go for like a 2-1 split to leave back, a, leave back an elephant for yourself and give them two. Uh, and then you could crimp the Chrome Mox and Swamp, but putting Chrome Mox in the graveyard is a little scary against the Yawgmoth's Will deck um, because you're actually giving them a ritual into the graveyard. Um, and even though there's Lurus in play especially. But uh, You could Terastodon. Nope, Terastodon can't hit creatures, so you can't get the Lurus. So he really has to decide how many of my things and how many of his things he wants to hit. You could Terastodon your own Mana Crypt, which is probably the play I would go for here. Um, Terastodon your Mana Crypt and maybe the, my two islands is a pretty reasonable line. Um, but yeah, this is tricky. I, I don't think there's like a... It's not just like... Often when you slam Terastodon, you immediately win the game, and I think it's actually pretty far away from that, given the, how much mana I already have and how much the Lurus is threatening to make. So, let's see. What is he targeting with this? I know he talked through a bunch of different options while we were playing. Um, but Sylvan Library is just like such a strong card that having that option all the time there is really scary for me. Uh, Death Wish of Note is a sorcery, I think. Let me double check that. Uh, Death Wish is a sorcery, yeah. So I can't, I can't do something really cute here. Um, not that I could anyway, because I don't have the two black mana for it. But uh, yeah, let's keep jumping forward. Okay, so he is taking out. Both islands, it appears. Both islands and a forest. Okay, so he leaves his mana crypt in play. That's super interesting to me, given that Rafelos likes the forest, obviously, and that mana crypt is threatening his life total. Maybe he's just not that worried, not that worried about the beatdown plan, um, given that he has a 9 9 and a 3 3. Like, I see why he's not that worried about it. Uh, but, I mean, tendrils can come out of nowhere and just add a lot of damage. So I think that's the line I'm going for here. Just looking at, like, all right. He has three cards left in hand. I don't know what they are yet, but I get taxi and probably feel, feel far better about going for the kind of pact of negation, offer you can't refuse me your own pact of negation kind of line. Um, but let's see, we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten mana still, because we have two mana plus the swamp and the hand, plus three from the lotus, plus three more from the lotus off the lurus. Uh, so that is nine. Okay, so nine mana. That's Death Wish and Tendrils makes a uh, storm count of one, two, three, four. Uh, now it still leaves a pact of negation. So storm count of four is eight damage. If I get through effectively with three, that's still only up to 11. So that's not enough. Storm count of one. Is there a way to, let's see, I have nine mana, Death Wish into Tendril only leaves two mana back. I could Thassa's Oracle to add another storm. That still only gets us to 13 though. So I really need him to interact with me at some point here. Otherwise I can't get there in storm. Because again, the, the magic number is to get to enough storm that we can get in with three damage and kill, which means we have to get to storm six because storm six means 12 damage or 12 life loss. Uh, leaving him at two, which is enough for the Lurus to win the game. Uh, but he has two blockers back for our two creatures. So I, I think from counting this out, I need him to interact because I can only get the Storm five naturally. Because we go Black Lotus, Black Lotus, Death Wish, Tendrils, and Athos's Oracle can be put in there beforehand. Um, but unless I packed. I guess I can cast the Death Wish first, getting the Tendrils. 
Okay, no, this is actually fine. I can Death Wish for the Tendrils. Uh, Death Wish goes to your XL zone, buddy. XL zone, cheater. Uh, the, uh, I can use the Pact of Negation offer you can't refuse trick on... No, I can't. I can't do it on... Oh, no, I have one mana extra. Yeah, so I can Thassa's Oracle, Pact of Negation, my own Thassa's Oracle. Offer you can't refuse my Pact of Negation. And then use Tendrils as the last one. Because I currently have six mana plus three. I have nine mana. So that's... Uh, oh, no, sorry. I've already used three of it. So I have one, two, three, six mana available. Let's see. Six uh, minus two is four. Nope, that still doesn't, that doesn't do it. Can I offer... Ref you can't refuse? Does that target... Thassa's Oracle? Yeah, no, so I, I need him to interact, or I need to lower shields. I don't think there's a way to... Uh, so I just go for, I go for the attack and make him block. Uh, yeah, I, 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 I don't think there's a way that I can do this without lowering shields. Because if I, if I cast the Thassa's Oracle, I need the offer you can't refuse to resolve to give me additional mana. Uh, or I can, um, or I can only get to five. So yeah, I, I think I just go for it here, uh, leaving him with 11 power on board. Um, and I'll be left with 11 life and it'll be down to a mana crypt. So this is, this is where it ends up is if I don't leave shields down, I have to, uh, I have to let him try to lose to his own mana crypt. I think he actually concedes before we get there, but this really does come down to a coin flip, I believe. And I'm I'm just like trying to do all this math in, during this game. I definitely recall that, um, but I'm pretty sure the hyphen concedes uh, after this, and that I, I couldn't have gotten there. Uh, I couldn't have gotten there to, to better than a fifty fifty. Um, Unless I, uh, oh no, okay, okay. So, so I got pushed to 14 life. Okay, sorry, there, there's, there it is. So I get down to the point where he'll be at one life and I, he'll have, he'll have to win two uh, mana crypts. So I get him down to a 25% chance of winning. Um, and the turn after that, I can also slap down this Thassa's Oracle. So does Terastodon have Trample? This is the, like, the silliness. Terastodon does not have Trample. So I could get to, um, I, I actually have two more turns where I can use the Elephant to block the next turn and then use the Thassa's Oracle to turn after that. So really he has to win four coin flips in a row to be able to win this one, uh, even if I don't take shields down here. So just to clear how it's, what I'm saying is I would I would leave Thassa's Oracle, Pact of Negation, and Offer You Can't Refuse all in my hand uh, and cast the Tendrils here. Uh, oh, sorry, sorry, cast Pact the Thassa's Oracle Oh, see, I'm actually, I'm actually going for it. I don't, I don't know. I think making him win four coin flips is probably better than just betting that he doesn't have a force in his hand. Wait, did I have it? Did I, did I miscount here? Where is that one mana coming from? Oh, ten... Okay, so... Black Lotus... Leaves back one mana after casting Thassa's Oracle. Pack of Negation can target it. Tendrils can target you. Is that fine? If he has a Force of Will, I just lose, right? Yeah, if he has a Force of Will, then he can copy one... He can counter one copy... Nope, okay, okay. He has to have exactly Force of Negation. That's what I'm worried about here. That's what I sat there thinking so long about. If he has exactly Force of Negation, he can counter one of the Tendrils copies leaving him at one life and leaving me with having to pay for that pack of negation trigger on my next turn and I lose. Uh, so it really comes down to, do I want him to be able to win? Do I do I trust that he can win four coin flips or do I think he has a force of negation in hand? I don't know. Uh, that I'd have to literally do math to figure out what should happen there, but I don't know. This deck's super hard. I don't know how to play this deck. Um, well... I'm glad I'm glad we've gotten through all of these. Sorry that uh, this last match we're covering what six months after it happened in August. Uh, so yeah, we're a little behind. Um, but this is a fun like 
get back into the mindset of a VRD. Hopefully no one tries to draft a Death Wish deck again because it seems like it'd be nightmares. Um, but no, we're going to have another another one of these things in person on the 14th. It's going to be Chicago versus St. Louis. That should be a lot of fun. And I'm excited to host it again now that my arms, even though they were broken in a bike accident, are back. Uh, energy level is back here as well. Um, and I just heard a baby crying upstairs, so I'm not dealing with that, which is really nice. Um, but yeah, no, I'm looking forward to seeing everybody a week from Saturday on the 14th. 